My name is Stephanie Chernow. I am the General Secretary for the Global Editors Network, and I'm so pleased to see everyone here, and I hope you guys are all enjoying the conference. Um, I'd like to introduce the next session, um, Why News Organizations Need More Women in more women leaders. Um, and your moderator for the session will be Paula Slier. She is from Russia today and she is the Middle East Bureau Chief. So thank you very much. It was about this time last year when I was on a foot patrol with American soldiers in the southern Afghan province of Zabul. Of course, I work for Russia today, so we were doing a series of reports of what it was like to be there embedded with the troops. And we were with a team of soldiers that call themselves a PRT, a provincial reconstruction team. And they were going to schools and hospitals and they were assisting the local people in building their infrastructure. So of course, like all journalists who are on an embed, I had a helmet and a bulletproof vest, but also had the painted nails, and we saw the kids that would follow us as we went along, looking at me, and I could figure out that they were probably trying to figure out who I was. When we got to the school, I took off my helmet, and the kids kind of gasped, and one of the boys plucked up the courage, and he came up to me and he said, ma'am, does your husband know you've left the house? <laughs> And it reminds me of another story of a colleague of mine in Gaza. She's a photojournalist, and she told me that when she was starting out in the profession, it was January 2009, and it was Operation Cast Lead. And the Israeli bombardment of Gaza was particularly heavy one afternoon, and there was a group of journalists that were going to that area, and they were all male, and they invited her to climb in the car and come with them. And she, say, she th said at the time she thought that this is it. She'd finally made it. She'd finally been welcomed by her male colleagues. They got to the place, and the car came under fire, and everybody opened the doors and ran out. And then a few minutes later, her colleagues quickly climbed back into the car, locked the doors, and drove off without her. A few days later, she bumped into them, and they said to her that that was a clear message that you're not welcome. Now, are we just talking about Afghan children? Are we just talking about colleagues in Gaza? Or does the problem run deeper, and is it more mainstream? Last year, the International Women's Media Foundation did a survey. It was a two-year survey, and they surveyed some 500 media organizations in 59 countries, and they found that only 27% of women hold top management positions. Now, the purpose of today's panel is not to complain. It's rather a discussion and a debate with, with some esteemed panelists. They bring with them a wealth of experience from Norway to Morocco, from Russia to the United States. And what I'd like to do is open to each panelist to address the topic for a few moments. Afterwards, we'll have a discussion, and then we'll take questions from the floor. So our first speaker is Sylvie Kaufman, who is the editorial director of Le Monde newspaper. Sylvie? Um, does this work? Yeah. Thank you very much. So um, what the title of the of this panel is uh, why news organizations need more women leaders. Well, I must say when I joined this business, this profession um, 30 years ago probably, I never thought 30 years later I would still have to answer this question. <laughs> but uh, apparently we still need to talk about this, so uh, let's go. Um, I, this morning and this afternoon there were actually quite a lot of women and female leaders on these panels. Uh, so that's uh, quite heartening and that to me shows that it's not that there are so many female leaders as you, the figures you've quoted are quite eloquent. Uh, 
73%, I mean three quarters of management, of top jobs in the media are held by men. So, but that, that showed that uh, when women do hold these positions, they are very active and very dynamic. So that's maybe one, uh, the beginning of an answer to this uh, question. Um, I would say there are three, three main reasons from my point of view. First, uh, diversity and gender equality are uh, good. <laughs> I think it's a no-brainer. I don't have to uh, go into details about this, but it's, uh, it's just um, logics and, and, and common sense. Uh, second, I, I do think that women, generally speaking, of course there are exceptions, as there are exceptions to, to men also, but women do bring a different style of management. Uh, as they have brought a lot of different things to journalism over the, the past decades, uh, there was a time when there were not uh, many women in journalism as writers or, or reporters, and, and, and the massive um, um, numbers of uh, women joining this profession has, I think, made a difference in the kind of journalism we, we have been publishing or broadcasting. So, um, to bring different styles of management together, I think, for companies in media as, as in other sectors, uh, is a plus, definitely. And third uh, uh, reason, I think, basically, more female leaders attract more female readers or viewers. It's, it's as uh, simple as this. Um, somebody who is uh, not here, unfortunately, because she couldn't make it, but she's on, on the board of Jen and she's a, a very interesting lady. It's Amanda Wilson, who is the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, and she's the first um, uh, female editor of, of that paper. And she told me last year in, in Hong Kong when we met that um, um, when she was appointed to that position, her company decided to make a huge um, advertising campaign about the fact that the Sydney Morning Herald was investing in women and, and had the first uh, woman as, a, as a, um, uh, 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 has the first female editor with her picture on billboards and she said she even got messages of people saying you look old and fat on this uh, picture. But still, uh, apparently it's been quite uh, uh, a, a good investment in terms of, um, of bringing female readers. So there are plenty of examples in our media, I think, of, of um, uh, initiatives Target, especially targeting women which have been very successful uh, in attracting readers or, or, or in being just successful media events. Um, I would quote a few examples. El País, the, the Spanish newspaper, has a blog called Mujeres, uh, which was created by, by women and it's attracting a lot of traffic. It's very successful. I go on it from time to time and it's very lively, a uh, lot of contributions and I think it went be the success went beyond their expectations. FT has this um, um, topic on, on their website, Women at the Top. Very interesting and I think it's quite successful. The International Herald Tribune, uh, Alison will tell us more about this, but has this series that she launched, female, The Female Factor. It is great, and I think it's also seen as a, as a big success, and everybody's contributing to it. Um, this morning we saw on CNN, uh, this, on one of the panels this morning, this project on um, this freedom project and this uh, report, in depth report about slavery that uh, Meredith. Uh, um, uh, launched and uh, I think this is very much this is not female targeted I suppose but this is something that has been these topics have been more and more covered uh, thanks to the presence of uh, to the, the the activism of I mean activism the action I would say of um, of uh, female editors um, I will just quote a few other facts and and, and I'll be done uh, for this argument um, uh, I think Jim Shisholm uh, quote so a study spotted a study on the on in 2010 uh, women on the web, which uh, um, showed that papers that did their best through the crisis of the print press in the uh, early 2000 in the years uh, in the 
2000 decade, where the papers that had managed to expand most their female readership. And he also noticed that 80% of business decisions in families are made by women. So that's a factor which should be, it, uh, which is taken account, uh, into account by advertisers also. And um, which should be an argument for investing more in women in newspapers and in uh, media organizations. Uh, women, I understand, are the ones who spend most time on social media. That's another factor which, is, uh, which should be uh, considered. Um, and I think I will uh, leave it there to, to leave some time to the others who will have, I'm sure, many more arguments. Thank you. <coughs> Wolfgang Blau is Editor-in-Chief of Zeit Online. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Quickly, um, what is Zeit Online? We are an, a, a large German news website with about 60, 60 editors. Uh, when I came on board four years ago, we were about 16. means I had the opportunity to recruit a lot. This is a new newsroom. And of course, newsroom culture is very uh, uh, resistant to change, but it was our advantage that this is a newly built organization. And uh, when I came on board together with my team, we wrote a mission statement. We said, what are some of the values we stand for that we want to touch over and over again across the desk, whether it's in sports or in the economics department? One was that we need a European integration. What form can be discussed, but this is an absolute value. Europe needs to move together more closely. Another one of a total of four main topics was that we said the equality, the equal rights of women and men is the most important indicator of how democratic a society is. Yes, there's social upwards mobility, all the other factors, but this is for us the key factor we will keep looking at. Uh, from that, we developed different editorial products, for instance, a video advisory uh, column by a career trainer, a lady who only trains women. Um, and in, in this video, it talks about body language, how to recognize certain male codes and behavior, and not how to imitate them, but how to work with them. And we noticed that a large part of the audience that was attracted by this column were men who wanted to understand better how they are sometimes acting to the advantage, disadvantage of women without even knowing it. So that told us that this is a topic that, that is not only interesting to women, uh, but uh, to, to many men as well. Um, a few months ago, there was a big campaign by hundreds and hundreds of German female journalists uh, arguing for a, a, what is called a women's ratio. Um, and they wrote personal letters to all the major chief editors asking them about their position towards the goal of having a women's percentage of 30% of all leadership positions staffed with women in German newsrooms by the year 2017. Um, and then, of course, we all started counting uh, where we are at. And one of the ambiguities of this campaign was that they didn't define clearly what is a leadership position. Um, is it a copy editor who has no team but has a major impact on the publication? Uh, or is it only defined by this is a person who has other people reporting to her? And that's the definition by which we went. We thought, this, it, no, it really matters having a female boss. This is what makes a female leadership position, even though there are many more other leadership positions, so to say, staffed with women in our newsroom. And we saw that we are already at 30% but we're surprised because we all think it's, it's not enough. Um, and in this discussion, we, we realize that it's worth taking a minute, really asking ourselves why, and not just go with the herd that now says, this is the thing to do, and so we do it, and somehow it makes for good press. Um, but to really differentiate what are the reasons and are they relevant. And what, what we came up with, of course, is you have a broader talent base because as an online newsroom, we, we are already faced with an enormous shortage of talent. It takes us typically six months for, for key positions to find the right person because there are so few editors out there, at least in Germany, with considerable online experience already. Um, and in order to even attract women's applications, you, they, they need to see that there are already other women working in key positions. It's a chicken-egg problem. You have to get started, but the start is the hardest to get a critical mass uh, of, of, of um, 
women leadership in your newsroom. Second is, yes, women lead differently as an argument. I must say, my newsroom is too small to have empirical evidence for that. I see strong individual differences in leadership styles, and I see the whole range of leadership styles amongst women and men. Um, and so I'm very careful to, to say, yes, I would think it's evident, it makes sense. I haven't seen it, and for me, it shouldn't be the prime reason. Um, yes, diversity is good, but there are, I think, stronger reasons for more women in newsrooms. Um, then, of course, there's the argument, the business argument, which seems striking, and business arguments always work the best, whether they're true or not, uh, which is that it, helps attracting, uh, that it helps attracting female readers. And for the reasons Sylvie outlined, of course, advertisers like a high female readership, and, and at least in Germany, the more, new, the more newsy you get, uh, the more male your audience gets, and then you try to counter that by offering uh, other topics that are known for attracting more female readers. Again, I don't see proof for that. I see some of the most prominent, amongst women, most prominent publications being run primarily by males in Germany. Uh, I do see, though, in newsroom discussions that oftentimes it's women, especially young women, who catch and critique uh, sexist bylines uh, under pictures or, or sexist, slightly, very subtly sexist headlines. Uh, these criticisms more often come from women than from men, and that, of course, is worth a lot. And then there's the justice argument, and I saw many chief editors also in their public responses to this campaign, this recent campaign in Germany, shy away from the moral argument. It was said, well, you know, we're, we're not there to produce uh, 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 morality, we are there to compete and to have a good product, and we have to hire the best people. And I personally, at this point, think there is a very strong moral case because we are not car manufacturers. We are moral institutions. From morning to evening, we raise our fingers and say, politician XYZ did wrong, is morally wrong on this case, and this company behaved unethically. So yes, we are moral institutions. And I think our moral credibility has to be measured by whether we give half of the population an equal chance at succeeding in our, in, 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 in our company. And for me, this, to this point, for lack of, of, of evidence on all the other three reasons I mentioned, for me, is the strongest reason. Um, and related to this moral argument then comes, a, again, another subversion of the diversity argument that we should care for more diversity overall, having more gay people in leadership positions, having more people with immigrant backgrounds in leadership positions. In, in Germany, also having more editors from Eastern Germany, which is difficult uh, in our newsrooms. And yes, I'm very much in favor of having more immigrants or, or, or editors with immigrant backgrounds in our newsroom. I'm even part of a mentors network. I'm mentoring uh, young editors with migration backgrounds. I still think that these two issues shouldn't be lumped together. Women are not a minority. Uh, and and to, to illustrate that, uh, every, every single person, every single one of us in this room here has been born by a woman. That's not something to forget, by the way. If you have not been born by a woman, please approach me. I'd like to interview you. Um, so these are my, my uh, initial remarks. I hope we can discuss uh, some of the practical challenges in hiring. They're tremendous issues. And maybe we can also briefly speak about the typical positions, um, calling it the pink ghetto, women typically are being uh, recruited for and others they are not. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist is Nadia Saleh. She is the editor-in-chief of L'Economista Econ Morocco. She'll be speaking in French, so you'll need to just adjust your speakers. Oui, je parle français. Comme j'étais... I was speaking in French. I was added to the agenda. I'm from an Arabic and Muslim country that has experienced the Arab Spring, and you'll see that it's quite something, and in some respect, very sad. Are you familiar with the full version of the tale of A Thousand and One Nights? Certainly not. It's about 1,000 volumes. If you speak with someone from the Arab world, they'll say it's nonsense, full of violence and immoral. Unfortunately, to answer the question about women in the newsroom, let me tell you my story, which is extremely immoral, lots of violence and nasty things. The Morocco where I live is becoming, is changing. 
Its democracy is such that it's gradually eliminating women from public life. When I started working in Morocco some 30 years ago, especially in the group that we set up just 20 years ago, there was a quota to protect jobs for men. Why do we do that? Because women work better, and immediately they take over from men, and that would imbalance everything. So they set up a quota to protect jobs for men. Before I came, I counted the number of uh, women who were editors-in-chief or the equivalent in Morocco. I found only seven out of 47 persons holding that position. Seven, that's two times less than last year because two left, because they got married. I think some years ago, a wedding or would not have caused people holding senior positions to leave their positions. Today, luckily, democracy is here. Unfortunately, it gave us a very misogynous government. There's only one woman in the government. That had never happened since the independence of Morocco 60 years ago. When women like me decided to found an association and we demonstrated in the streets on social networks when we voiced our opinions in my group, our radio, of course, played a significant role in these protests. The prime minister said, I'm sorry, but we don't cho choose depending on quotas, but depending on expertise. So we set up a major women's association called the Incompetence. You can track us on the social networks. This government, there's only one woman there as a minister, of course, minister of social conditions and so on. And she's calling into question things that are supported by uh, donors in the, in the Northern Hemisphere to promote women and by the UN and so on. And this woman is saying that is intolerable given the country's uh, culture. So let's get rid of that based on gender equality. <laughs> the other funny things as, as well, we never had a bigamous minister before. Now we have two in this government. Our minister of justice, who is an attorney, um, bigamous, bigamous, paid an official visit to an imam who launched a fatwa. Do you know what that is? Stating that it's very good to marry girls as of the age of nine. Last year's law, or a, a, a law dating back to the last decade, on had forbidden marriage before the age of 18 and is now being called into question by judges. What can I tell you that's not a sad story? Let me look at the other page. Have I written down something that's not sad? Well, before this happened to us, all these things about quotas and uh, women, it was really pointless discussion. I think it's all real about our survival. Unfortunately, it's not over yet for us. Because in my group, we had uh, two inquiries amongst youngsters from 15 to 29, one five years ago and one last year. And we can see that young people are those who are the most close to the promotion of women, even more close than their parents and even more so than their grandparents. So it's a societal phenomenon that is really fundamental. And if you have any ideas to have democracy with the promotion of women in the Arab world, please visit us. Thank you. Our next panelist is Arne Jensen, the Assistant Secretary General of the Association of Editors Norway. Thank you. Uh, a few years ago, we asked ourselves uh, in the association, um, why is it that uh, the percentage of female members uh, are so low, especially uh, taking, um, uh, especially when when the increase of female journalists were quite. Uh, uh, 
were quite large. So it was like 40 or almost 50 percentage of the journalists were female, but, uh, but only like 19 or 20 percent uh, ah, thank you, um, of, the, of the editors. Uh, now we did like, uh, like Sylvia, we, we asked ourselves, is it necessary to, to give an answer to the question why it is wise to have female uh, editorial leaders? And we said no. So we skipped directly to uh, the question, how can we get hold of the female leaders? Uh, and what we did was um, we made a survey on approximately 100 female leaders, editorial leaders, asking, asking them, why did you become uh, uh, an editorial leader? What advice would you give to other women, journalists, who want to be uh, an editorial leader? And what advice would you give to uh, the media companies and the editors-in-chief who wants to hire, to want to get hold of, um, of the female editorial leaders, the candidates? Uh, and we also asked 400 uh, female journalists, uh, what does it take uh, to get you to seek uh, a position as an editorial leader? And what are the obstacles for you to do so? And it's very interesting. Um, I'll come to the answers in the end. Uh, but the project had uh, several elements. One thing is we started looking at ourselves. How is it when, when the association uh, have their conferences, who is up on the stage? Basically men. Uh, what does it say in our regulations? Does it say anything about seeking to have equality between men and women? No. So we started to uh, a, very, um, a very strong regime on at least, there, sh there should be 50, 50% uh, men and women on stage on our conferences. Uh, now, I looked with uh, some help of Candice, uh, my dear friend. Uh, we went through uh, the participants lists for this conference. There are 20% uh, uh, women uh, participants. There are 22% uh, uh, women on stage. But if you look at the keynote speeches, there are 12 men. And this, so, and this is not, I don't, I don't think this is a, a, a coincidence. It's a coincidence because no one have, have thought about it. But it has to do with what kind of signals do we send out. So we started very, uh, uh, we started exposing uh, the female editors on stage uh, with the idea that maybe they would be good role models, not only for other female editors and male editors, but, but also for journalists, female journalists. Get them out in the, in, in the open, expose the female editors. Um, and the other thing we, we did, and we changed the regulations for the association so that four out of nine board members now has to be women. Um, and the, the third thing we did was to, to, uh, to make a, a handbook or a manual, if I can, oh, it's up to me. <laughs> oh, this may be, ah. Um, it's translated, uh, it's, uh, uh, the title uh, is a kind of street, uh, it's almost impossible to translate, it's a kind of a street language, street expression, uh, how to get the good ladies. Uh, and we made it all the way by uh, making the cover in pink and with a, uh, a couple of nice female uh, uh, legs uh, on the cover. Uh, but inside, we tried to make, uh, to make, a, a, um, to distillate uh, the best advice that we could give to the media companies um, and, to, um, and to editors in chief, for that matter, in how to get the good ladies, how to get hold of them. Uh, because Wolfgang said, uh, when chief editor says, we have to hire the best people, <laughs> okay, how does hiring uh, really work? In the, uh, in the newsrooms where I've been, it works approximately like this. The news editor is going, uh, is going to be away for, for work for some while to write a book or something, uh, and then the chief editor comes into the newsroom and says, okay, we need someone to step in for the news editor. Who's there? And there are four guys reaching their hand in the air. Why? Because they're guys. We are born to be leaders. Uh, and you can have four female journalists 
who are, who are uh, equally or better qualified, who don't raise their hands because they think, am I really good enough? Ah, uh, this is a tough one. Ah, uh, maybe not. And so you start recruiting from the ones who think they are the best leaders, and you start recruiting the guys who looks a bit like yourself. Like me, I'm 50, I'm recruiting a guy on 40, and he will be looking a bit approximately like me when he's 50, poor guy. <laughs> uh, so we have to change that. So what are the, what are the advices? I'll come to the, um, I'll come to the essence. Uh, there are five. First of all, try to recruit equality in the newsroom overall, because the critical mass, uh, you, you have to, to, to have an eye on that. Break, this is the answers from the female leaders and the, and the female journalists. I, I didn't invent them. Break down the male culture, or maybe I should say the macho culture, uh, that still rules in many uh, newsrooms, at least the ones I know about. Uh, look for the potential female leaders on an early stadium. You have to go hunting. Not like in the streets get the good ladies, but in the newsroom in a civilized way. You have to look for them. You have to uh, ask them, could you, maybe you could, you could think about being an, a, a, a leader one day. And they, the female candidates, they have to think about it. it, have to, it they ha the thought has to mature. Um, then they ha there has to be the possibility to combine the working life with the family life. Uh, when I started working with this manual, I had a lot of strong women around me, uh, experts on, uh, on environmental uh, uh, issues, uh, working environmental issues, and, and the relationship uh, between uh, uh, male and females in the working life. And I was very, very mo modest, and, I, uh, and suddenly one of them said, now let's get one thing clear. Women and men are different, and you have to recruit them different. You have to recruit women by go and, and, and look for them, because they have to be encouraged to take the leading job in opposition to many men. Uh, and the last point, you have to give them a, a, a real follow-up. You have to uh, give them guidance, you have to give them knowledge, you have to, give them, uh, you have to be supportive when they step into the leader uh, jobs, because they have for some reason, less confidence than many men who, who should have less confidence than we have. Uh, and then I should end with, uh, uh, with a quote from one of the, uh, in the survey that we made, one of the uh, uh, female leaders uh, who said that, you have to remember this, uh, women are different. The only thing they have in common is that they, is that they are not men. Thank you. Thank you. Alison Smile is the Executive Director of the International Herald Tribune. Alison? Sorry. Please. I'm, I'm very sorry. I have... Yes, no, sorry. I just have to say this, because the, the, uh, the percentage of, of uh, female members uh, in the association has increased from 19 to 29 from 2006 up to now, and the, and the increase of uh, editors-in-chief has been from 16 to 27. No problem. <laughs> Does this work? Yeah? So, um, I'll be very, very brief. I think it was really interesting to listen to all these different impressions from different countries. And I was fascinated by the question being posed, sort of why news organizations need more women leaders. I mean, I think we need more women leaders in many, many fields. Um, in both devising and executing the law, for instance, or in business in general. Um, so that would be my first point. The second point is it's perfectly obvious that newsrooms, particularly since they chronicle e events of the time in which they exist, should try to reflect the nature of society. I completely agree with the point don't make women into a minority, it's, it's a sort of more or less 50-50 existence, so that's the balance perhaps to strive for. But it should be part of an overall policy that looks at having ethnic, geographic, financial and all other kinds of diversity to try, I mean, I think newsrooms in general, you know, people who work in journalism don't tend to live 
very rich lives. I mean, they're not financially super wealthy, but they're not generally speaking also very poor. And I think a lot of what we're seeing in Europe now, I try very hard to be, for us to be chronicling what is happening to people who are living through this austerity. And there's plenty of studies. I don't think there's a definite conclusion, but there are plenty, there's quite a lot of research that seems to indicate that women are suffering disproportionately in this. And I do think one thing you can do as a woman editor, I hope you all saw the front page of the International Herald Tribune this morning. We have a woman there who's in Spain. She's just learned that her mortgage is, she's not going to have her property impounded yet. And her face is just very, it's very much from life. It's not at all a posed photo. And I think it's very important to consider how do we depict women in media. And I think women editors are much more conscious of that than men editors. Um, it's like you said about the young women being conscious of sexist angles in heads and so on. But if you look at a front page, I think you should be able to see at least one woman depicted there or talked about. And it shouldn't always be Angela Merkel, who um, is coming in for her fair share of of, I would say, also almost chauvinist criticism in this. I mean, you, obviously, you criticize a political leader. That's what we do in the news business. We look at their actions and try to assess them or report them. Um, but I would argue that in some cases, she has been made to look unduly sort of severe and school mommy out of a real stereotype, both of Germans and of women in power. Um, very briefly, I think the other difference that women leaders in newsrooms can make, and thank you, Sylvie, for mentioning the female factor, that series I honestly don't think would have happened if we had had a male editor. That sounds like a rather large assertion. Um, it d grew out of a book that was written by Nick Kristoff, the New York Times columnist, and his wife, Cheryl Wu Dunn, Half the Sky. And it was a magazine issue that was devoted to women in the early 21st century that gave us the first material to do a big spread on women. I said, oh, great, you know, it's a weekend in August, there won't be any news, really. We'll devote two full inside pages to this. The photography was fantastic. And what was really interesting, it just so happened that every single person who worked on this issue, from photo editor to layout person to copy editing to how to present, turned out that every single person was a woman. <laughs> but it wasn't planned that way. But I do think it was noticeable once we decided after a lot of newsroom discussion to launch this series that it really was mostly women who came to the discussions. Um, it has, I think, convinced more and more men who work at the IHT and in the larger New York Times organization, which we should note has the New York Times now has its first woman executive editor, Jill Abramson, and she is reckoned to be among the most powerful women in the world. And I think that is a very good indication of how powerful newsroom leaders in general can be and often are. And obviously, we should try and have as many women and as many, as many diverse leaders of these of these operations as we possibly can. Um, I'm going to shut up because I'm sure it's much more interesting to discuss or listen to questions. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We don't have a lot of time, so if you can just keep your answers kind of brief. Sylvia, I'll start with you. You ran a survey where you found that women were cited seven times less often in sources than men were. And so you tasked your newsroom with trying to get women cited as sources, and they got around that by writing articles about women. So for you, where, where is the starting point in terms of tackling the problem? How, how, how do you know that? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was um, uh, one study, a group at Le Monde had studied uh, how often we quoted, how women were represented in the paper. So we found that um, uh, eighteen percent I think of the the 
people quoted as sources in the stories. So we're not talking about women as subjects of stories, but women mentioned in stories uh, as sources were only 18%. Yes, 18% of the sources we, we quoted as experts, as people who made statements or, or who gave information, uh, were men. So um, one March 8, because this is the one day where uh, at Le Monde <laughs> were um, supposed to talk about women as such, so um, I said, why don't we um, try a, the parity of the sources day? And so in the editorial conferences, we talked about this, and, and so the, 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 the idea was that um, if we could find two with equal competence uh, sources which would be equally qualified, sorry, uh, for one story. If one was uh, a woman and another was uh, a man, we would go for the man. So it was kind of affirmative action for um, uh, female sources. And I must say, though we talked a lot about it during the editorial conferences, but this created a lot of confusion, and most of the uh, editors understood that we had to do as many stories about women as stories about men. So the exercise was not totally successful, and um, uh, but afterwards, you know, we had a critical review, and we uh, it was understood better. And I, uh, there are associations in in France which are of women which are involved in. Uh, promoting women as sources, as experts, you know, promoting to the media, giving them um, a, a range of, uh, of uh, women who are competent sources and who can be uh, interviewed or quoted in the media. And, and, you know, some of our journalists had this experience, which goes uh, uh, back to what you said. So they would call up a, a, a woman who is an expert in in, in one field to uh, ask her to, you know, to interview her and, and this woman would say oh hold on I will pass you on, I will transfer you to my boss he knows much more than I do about this Yet this, uh, this would uh, uh, be a kind of uh, behavior which t doesn't make things uh, easy but um, yeah that, that's an example of things which can make uh, women more visible in the, in the media Alison, let me pick up with you. Do you think that women are to blame, that women are not pushing themselves enough, not putting themselves forward for management positions? Um, I've been to God knows how many women's conferences where that's asserted, so I guess I believe it. But I can't really say that I think that that's been my experience over the years in newsrooms that I've worked in. Um, I, th I think it is more difficult in sort of corporate business, I, re I really do. But I do also think that many large corporations have, have now really gotten the message and really are trying to promote women in a way that I'm not so sure that journalists' organizations are as conscious about that. Um, I really do believe that having sources quoted as women, having people that you see on television in positions of power being women, that does, it sends its own message. And I was actually just thinking as you were talking about, you know, women not being the first to say, I'll take that news editor's position. So why have I never, I personally never hesitated to sort of do anything? And I actually bizarrely was thinking that maybe it had to do with something that I found throughout my childhood and teenage years to be sort of old-fashioned, which is that I went to an all-girls school. So I never had this thing of, you know, oh, the boys are thrusting forward more or whatever, because you were just in an environment of all girls, and I never thought about people not being leaders or not being able to pursue something, because there was no counter-example, there was no... I don't, I, I don't know if that made a difference or not, but I think, it, I think it, it's important not to grow up, if possible, with barriers in your head. Um, and, yet, and I was lucky. <laughs> I'd like Anna to respond. Um, and one of my questions to you, Anna, is 
From your experiences, can, can what you've learned be applied to other nations, or are the differences in Northern Europe too much a product of an internal culture to be applied elsewhere? Well, I think... Uh, well, I, I think we have to realize that there are cultural uh, differences uh, who, who will uh, affect uh, uh, these questions. Um, so, I, and I can only speak for my Norwegian experience. But in the last, uh, the last newspaper I was, uh, I was uh, uh, editing, um, there was a, a strange culture because my deputy editors, they had made some kind of... Um, they had some kind of idea that to be an editor in this newspaper, you have to work, uh, you have to work past normal working hours every day. And why could they do that? Yes, they could do that because their wives pick up, picked up the children in the kindergarten and uh, went home and made dinner, and uh, so they could come uh, home at seven o'clock or something like that. Uh, uh, yes, I know this is Norway. Uh, I know, I know. But, but, uh, but then I said to these guys, look, this is, this is not working because the signal we are sending out to the journalists and especially the female journalists is that if you're going to have uh, uh, kids and you're going to have uh, a man who's have, uh, who has a job that, uh, uh, that uh, demands him to work uh, overtime uh, off and on, uh, then you can't be an editorial leader in this newspaper. So guys, at four o'clock, off you go. And you have to organize your working day so that you can leave at four o'clock. Let me just come in because time is running out and I want to ask Nadia. Nadia, you come from the Middle East where culture can be a big barrier in terms of women reaching positions of management. I'm curious, after the Arab Spring, have you found that there's more opportunities for women? And I ask the question because it turns out that in Egypt, after the Arab Spring, whereas women once held 12% of parliamentarian positions, today they're down to 2%. So is the Arab Spring good news for women? No. I can't speak for the Middle East because I'm not very familiar with it. It's true that in Morocco, we had a lighter version of the Arab Spring, but it's not over yet. It's a disaster for women. It really is a disaster for women. I forgot to point out something joyful in my presentation earlier. I knew a big um, Moroccan banker, Mr. Manami. He said, I will have gender equality for every position except for his, because he was a general manager. Anyway, he did that, as he said, to civilize guys. And it did civilize guys in his bank. They learned to dress properly, to shave, to speak without using bad language, and to live normally. If there's one benefit to draw from the presence of women for guys, it's precisely that, civilizing them. But in the Arab countries, unfortunately, that's not the story. We've almost run out of time, but Wolfgang, the last question to you. We've been talking earlier in sessions about business and good business sense when it comes to journalism. Is there any proof that more female editors will attract more female viewers and listeners? I would think so, but I don't see any proof. Um, I, I, I really, yes, you would, you would think so. On the other hand, I also, I made a strong case about nudity on site online, that I said there's nothing wrong with, with pictures of naked women. I, I, of course, love to see beautiful naked women, but the context is important, and I don't want it on our side, uh, because there's, there's the question of dignity. And, and, and it being, is it artistic or is it just there to drive clicks? And we don't want that. And there were very, very few cases where uh, I saw, I think, naked Carla Bruni show up on our site back then. And it was always uh, a female editor who said, what's your problem? She's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> which, you know, how can you argue that? So it's not that black and white. And, and as I said earlier, that would not be my, my primary reason to to hire more women. One thing I have learned um, in these last four years is that, that the German law of parental leave is really crucial. 
um, because you know I would be lying if I wouldn't wouldn't admit that when it comes to staffing a position that's really strategically important and I'm looking at a, a female 38 year old candidate who has no children yet of course the question is in my mind how long will she stay and 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 the, the damage we will be suffering as a newsroom if she then s sits in my office and tells me the happy news which is a wonderful news I now have two little children myself I'm really genuinely happy when any of my colleagues has babies but it can be really devastating uh, for the organization and what happened is this German law very much incentivizes fathers to also take a parental leave and as a woman you can take the maximum I think correct me if I'm wrong I think you can a maximum of two years you can take and you can only take the maximum if the father also takes at least two months and now I see desk editors our economic desk editors taking nine months and, and others are taking long times and so practically the risk now is is evenly spread when I look at a, a, a young man or a young woman, the risk is pretty much the same, that, that he or she will take off for a year, and that's just something we have to adjust to. And so law can do wonders. And here's just one last statistic. I mean, I work out there in the field as a news reporter, and I, I was often under the impression that there's more women out there as journalists, but apparently not. Apparently on the journalist level, only 36% of reporters in news organizations are women. So the challenge is, for decades we've fought to get our rights as women journalists, and now it seems that perhaps we might have a few more decades ahead of us to make sure that women play their full weight in being management positions in newsrooms. Thank you so much to all my panelists.